A recent report reveals that for the three children are diagnosed of cancer globally and 12% of those children die every day, bringing the survival rate of cancer in children very low. What can be done to reduce this ugly figure? On Health Business this morning, we're taking a look at childhood cancer. Hello and welcome to Health Business. My name is Oluwa Toyin Kolawale. First on the lineup is the news. Stay tuned. Across all ages, ethnic groups and socioeconomics, childhood cancer remains the number one leading non-infectious disease-related cause of death in developing countries, with 43 children diagnosed with cancer every day. 12% of those diagnosed do not survive, bringing the survival rate very low. According to reports submitted at a 2017 cancer summit in Abuja, about four children die of cancer daily in Nigeria due to late presentation at the hospital, high cost of cancer treatment, superstitious beliefs, financial constraints, lack of access and inadequate treatment facilities. Little Emmanuel Ebiono is three years old and has been diagnosed with cancer of the blood. His mother recounts her ordeal and the agony of taking care of him. Actually, we based in Togo. It's from that Togo, that August, he fell down with the stomach. From there, we started carrying him and he cannot eat. We went to private hospital over there. They say he have wound, he have, they call it his wound. They need to treat him. They gave him some antibiotics for one week. And after then, we came back. Within some weeks after, he started running temperature. And the temperature was 38, 39. Once I check it, it's always high. To the extent, it's 40. She explained that if not for the help of a non governmental organization, a boy would not be alive. That'd be helping me. I'm so grateful they have helping me, helping the manners from the beginning of this treatment up to date. They have been bringing the drugs, everything during the radio, during the chemo, during the time of operation, they are the people that is helping him. The founder of the Dorcas Cancer Foundation, a non-governmental organization for children living with cancer, Dr. Adedayo Joseph noted that children were dying of cancer on a daily basis as a result of expensive treatment which many Nigerian parents cannot afford. It costs an average of two million to take a child from diagnosis to the end of treatment. Sometimes less, sometimes even much more than that. And raising that money is not easy. You know, a lot of our donors are individual donors um, and everybody is challenged by the economy. It's not always easy to reach out and give, you know, 
what keeps our donors going is seeing the children. They love it when we can send them videos and pictures and they see in Yolua playing, they see Manor playing, they, you know, that keeps them going, you know, to see that, oh, Joshua is doing well, Samuel is cancer free. But it's not easy. It's not easy for anybody to give. And it, it really is a challenge. Right now, we have a waiting list of more than 10 children who are waiting for a phone call from us to say, oh, we have, your, we have money for your treatment now, you can come along. And that's not easy to go home every day knowing that there are 10 people waiting for you to call them and they have no hope until you, give, until you make that phone call. Dr. Joseph also called on the government, the private sector players, donor agencies and the non-governmental organizations to invest more in cancer care by making treatment accessible and affordable, thereby reducing the huge financial burden on the parents who are still struggling to pay out of pocket. All we want is to see the children get better. So anyone who has that goal is our partner. And we're willing to partner with anybody who is willing, who wants the same thing that we want. So, and the truth about it is that in, in any nation, I know people complain, but you cannot get anything done without partnership with the government. And the truth is, the government is trying, they're doing what they can, but even in the best of countries, the government doesn't do everything. So they, they will do what they can and we also have our own roles to play. Other medical experts called for urgent intervention and proactive ways to reduce the burden of this disease in children through increased awareness to improve early detection, accurate diagnosis, adequate and qualitative health care service to enable prompt and proper treatment of the disease. In the past, in, our, in this part of the world, in Nigeria for instance, um, communicable diseases used to be the order of the day. Now all over the world, non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cancers are very common. Now because we focus on women and children, particularly, we are into breast and cervical cancer screening. This is a way of you know, detecting cancers early. When we detect it early, it's much easier to take care of. These experts unanimously agreed that the cost of treatment for childhood cancer is enormous and most parents cannot afford it. They, however, called pharmaceutical companies in Nigeria to intensify in their research and commence production of medications that will combat cancer. <laughs> It's time to join Dr. David Ikudaisi on regenerative medicine. Hello viewers, welcome to another episode on regenerative medicine. I'm Dr. David Ikudayisi, a U.S. board certified internist and also a regenerative medicine specialist. Um, today I'm going to be talking about another condition that can be addressed with regenerative medicine and the condition is arthritis. Um, first of all, for those that are watching this for the first time, regenerative medicine is a relatively new field of medicine um, that addresses how the body function can be restored back to normal because of all the damages that have occurred due to age and uh, diseases or congenital uh, di disorder. For example, arthritis have the, is actually inflammation of the joints. But there are different types. It could be, let's say, um, osteoarthritis, that is more common with age, you know, wear and tear. It could be uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is an example of, the, of an autoimmune uh, dis uh, disorder. It, you know, it could be inflammatory arthritis. So there are pretty much different um, arthritis. But the point is that there is inflammation at the connection of two bones. Where, um, which is why they call it arthritis. Now, you, you can address this by taking pain medications. There are some medications that reduce the inflammation in, at those joints, and they do work. But you know, some medications also have side effects. 
Likewise, um, some arthritis could have gone so far that surgery may be recommended. I know there are some of you who have been told that you need surgery but do not want to go for surgery. Well, the good news is regenerative medicine can help. What has been found out is that if either platelet-rich plasma therapy or other stem cell therapy is being used to treat those joints, the joints will start to regenerate itself in an accelerative way. And for those that don't understand what platelet-rich plasma means, that is when you take the patient's blood, you process it, spin it, and take the section that is rich in platelet and inject it back into that joint. For the other stem cell therapy, that is when you take the bone marrow, the fat from the patient, or umbilical cord donated, you know, uh, by from the newborn baby, uh, process that, extract the stem cells, and inject it into the joint. Of course, the other stem cell therapy works faster, better than the platelet-rich plasma. But the whole point is that any one of them you use will help to stimulate the repair, the regeneration in those joints. And that can help some patients to avoid surgery. There have been cases both in Europe, even in Nigeria here, whereby people that are in wheelchair due to, let's say, osteoarthritis, after three months, they are walking without um, um, with, uh, cane or wheelchair. Or wheelchair. That by the time they, they ask them how is that pain, they even forgot they have pain in the joints. That's the beauty of the regenerative uh, medicine. So you've been told that you need surgery or um, you have to be on silent medication for the rest of your life. That may not be the end of, uh, of, of the situation because regenerative medicine is relatively new but is here to offer hope for patients where we, under the orthodox uh, uh, protocol, have told the patient that there's nothing else we can do. Also, I would like to use this opportunity uh, to make sure that we all understand that when it comes to other stem cell therapy, the source of these uh, stem cells are the patient. So we call it autologous. That makes it safe. You can also get um, stem cell donated from another person, but there you need to make sure that there's a proper cross match and there's risk of rejection in certain cases. But when it's from your own body, taken from you, given back to you, there's no risk of rejection. That is the autologous part. So that is the beauty uh, of it. I want to thank all of you watching. Uh, this moment, we will like to continue this uh, regenerative medicine topic next week. We will be addressing another uh, condition that can be treated with regenerative medicine. I am Dr. David Ikuda Ese, U.S. Board Certified Internist, and I'm looking forward to see you next week. Make sure you tune. Next is the pharmacy segment. Pharmacists in Nigeria have identified unrestricted access to medicines through the open drug and inadequate regulatory enforcement in markets as the root cause of rampant drug misuse and abuse in the country presently. The pharmacist noted that the incessant postponement by federal government on the closure of open drug market places and full implementation of the National Drug Distribution Guidelines, NDDG, will further aggravate the situation. Community pharmacists in Lagos, however, urge Nigerian youth to shun drug abuse and addiction in order not to come down with the harmful side effects later in life. This call was made at the unveiling of the Youth Say No to Drug campaign by the association. The outgoing chairman of the association, Biola Paul Ozie and other executives, explained that over 26.4 million youth abuse prescribed drugs globally. 
every dream dies when you begin to indulge in drug abuse and we want a situation where our youth will not indulge in drug abuse rather they will come out those of them that need that need help they can approach their community pharmacies we will link them up to facilities where they can undergo rehabilitation procedures and that way they can be reintegrated back to the society all hands need to be on deck the society the public the parents the guidance the regulators the pharmacists the users of the drug consumers every hand must be on deck to see that we put an end to rampant drug abuse and misuse especially among our youth because they are future and we need to protect them a lot of people don't actually know that they are abusing drugs people take all sorts over the counter drugs for example tramadol people go initially people used to buy they go to the pharmacies they just buy tramadol but now what we're doing in the community pharmacy a lot of community pharmacies in lagos they don't sell such drugs anymore except with prescription these are drugs that are meant for specific uses they affirm that to guarantee the future of the country nigerian youth must be saved from abusing drugs which could either damage their kidneys cause hypertension lung cancer neurological disorder or turn them into destitutes the law enforcement agents and the people controlling the distribution of drugs in Nigeria have to be awake to their responsibility. Let people who are trained on drugs handle drugs. For example, in Lagos City, the registered pharmacy is not up to 70, but on registered premises, it's over 2,000 who are not being controlled who are not being directed, they are just handling drugs anyhow. Drug abuse remained a major health problem globally and no longer secret that many Nigerian youth experiment with drugs at one point or the other. <laughs>today we're going to be discussing something very interesting, male infertility. This is responsible for about 50% of the time for why a couple is unable to achieve pregnancy. Male infertility can be defined as a situation in which a man is unable to make a fertile woman achieve pregnancy. It's usually unsuspected because there is no symptom. Now what are the causes of Male infertility, you may ask me. The causes of low numbers would be that is genetic, that is, is being inherited, or there is undescended testes, a situation where a man, you know, the testes are it's said that they are supposed to be in such a condition where they can always get fresh air. Sometimes you can look at some people's scrotum and you cannot see a testes, or sometimes one is missing, or sometimes the two. Also, infection can cause low number of sperm count. And then there is something called torsion, which usually is a result of either an accident or injury. And the thing that we call the worm of the testes, which we call varicocele. And sometimes you're producing good number, but the function is just not good enough. Then other things are like lifestyle, drugs, aqua smoking they tend to reduce sperm count obesity reduces sperm count and excessive exercise can also do that or sometimes there is hormonal imbalance which uh, causes this test is not to be working well and in some very few people also there's some they have they're said to have sperm antibodies now 
how do we make a diagnosis whether a man has male factor infertility? That's where the catch is because most of the time there is, like we said earlier on, there are no symptoms. And unless you do a test where the sperm is actually examined under the microscope, you, it's, not, it's impossible for you to make a diagnosis. So you need to do the test and the, if that is done in laboratories. So we, here we look at the count, we look at the density, we look at the ability to move of the sperm, we look at the abnormal forms, we look at the percentage of abnormal forms, and then we look at the number of Y cells that are positive there. And then we can then, the World Health Organization has given us some guidelines on how to see whether they are normal or abnormal. The interesting thing is that this, what we have regarded as normal, has continued to decrease over the years. Because it's obvious that sperm count is decreasing with time. Then the thing, the next thing is how can we treat when the sperm parameters are not at par? We can look at this from three different views, drugs, surgery, and assisted conception. I, I think that's what we're going to, where we're going to round up today. We'll see you next time. Remember, together we can conquer infertility. My name is still Dr. Abayomi Ajayi. Catch you. the curtains on health business this morning for sponsorship and advert placement please call the numbers showing on your screen remember living healthy is a serious business my name is Olu Watoyin Kalawale and the program is health business till I come your way next week bye for now <laughs>